So why does anything exist, rather than nothing at all? How did the universe start? What happens to us when we die? What is the meaning of life? And maybe most importantly, what the heck do any of these questions have to do with whether or not we're living in a computer simulation? Well, in part two of our three-part discussion with Jim Elvidge about his new book, Digital Consciousness, Jim answers these and many other questions, providing an interesting new digital spin on some age-old quandaries. Does it all add up? Does it make sense? Well, stay tuned. <music> Welcome you to part two of our special three-part discussion with our very special guest, Jim Elvidge. Jim, welcome back to the program. Oh, thanks very much, Phil. Looking forward to this part. I think we're going to get into some really good stuff. Well, we set it up great in part one. We, we established, I think, beyond the shadow of a doubt that we live in a simulation, right? I'm convinced now, anyway, and I, I think you were, you're, you were pretty much there anyhow, right? So I, I, didn't, I didn't feel like you had too much, too much convincing. But uh, now we're going to talk about part two. We're calling it God, the Universe, and Everything. So I want to ease into this just a little bit and talk about a little bit of philosophy because I think there's some fun philosophical points that you make in the book. And let's talk just briefly about having an... Uh, idealistic versus a materialistic view of the universe. And those words are misunderstood. I think people might think I'm talking about whether you're being greedy or whether you uh, are, are a, a very optimistic and, uh, you know, a person who believes in virtue or something like that. That's not what we mean by either idealism or materialism. We're talking about something else. Talk a little bit about what those things mean and why do you think there are pretty strong arguments that one might go the uh, idealism direction rather than materialism. Yeah, sure. Uh, good, good starting point. And um, the, I'm glad you brought up kind of the, the nature of the words because all the words that we use are so heavily loaded and they mean so many different things to different people. It's a really good idea to kind of define them up front, what we mean by them when we talk about them, things like simulation or consciousness or whatever. Um, they, and God, those words, you know, they carry images, uh, the way people learn, they, they kind of model things in their head, they compare them to things, and, you know, everybody may have a different interpretation of uh, a lot of these kinds of things, so it's good to kind of set that down, uh, you know, up front for our discussion. So right. the, the idea, idea of a materialist word, um, and it, you could look up, say, scientific materialism, uh, reductionism, things like that, it's the idea that there's an objective reality out there. So independent of our conscious experience, there's something physical there. We close our eyes, it's still there. We didn't, if we didn't exist, it would still be there. We could actually go out and, you know, theoretically, we could, we could measure that it exists. What two, peop two different people measure, what two different labs measure, they should get exactly the same thing. So it's, it's very objective. Um, but that's not all. Um, there, there's also the idea that uh, consciousness doesn't have any uh, influence to objective reality. Things are deep down based on a deterministic set of physical laws. You know, this particle moves this way because of this interaction that follows these physical laws, and that's it. So uh, when we talk about things like the observer effect or telepathy, you know, to pick two ends of the spectrum, you know, those things run counter to the idea of a materialist uh, paradigm. So the people who believe in the materialist view of the world they have to go to great lengths to try to explain some of these strange anomalies. On the flip side is idealism, which is basically uh, saying that um, our reality is uh, virtual in some way. You know that we're, you know, consciousness is separate uh, from the, you know, the physical reality, or maybe the physical reality doesn't exist, or it exists in a soft way. Um, this is more the idealistic view, and it's uh, clearly where uh, my philosophy lands. And I think. You know, again, there's just tremendous uh, evidence for that. There's really no evidence for the materialist point of view. There was 
100 years ago because our instruments could only measure things that were, you know, bouncing around at a very coarse level that seemed to perfectly follow the laws of physics. But, you know, along comes quantum mechanics and, you know, strange anomalies and other things, and uh, that materialist view just doesn't work anymore. It's just been hard to let go of for a lot of people. I, I think the best argument against materialism is that materialists pretend it's not true when they make arguments, right? It's like, what, what is more pointless than if you're a pure materialist and you believe everything is deterministic than trying to talk someone else into something, right? Mm -hmm. than, than, than trying to tell someone else, this is what you should believe, right? Why would you ever make an argument if you believe everything is completely deterministic? Uh, uh, be, because there, there is yeah. no possible... <laughs> There's no possibility of anyone actually reading that then and learning the truth, right? Because none of that happens, right? Um, right. It's, it's all just it's, – it's all electrons moving around in my brain with no – there's no me here ultimately, yep. right? And, and there's, there's no one to be persuaded, right? And um, to, to me, that makes the case right there. It's like what, if, you're, if you really believe what you're saying, why would you ever try to persuade anyone of anything? Right. right. You know, and science doesn't even make sense anymore because science is all about observation. And so we make choices in science. But if things are fully deterministic, then the choices are already made for us. Why even right. do science? Why, why even, you know, explore? Why, you know, why develop knowledge? We're going to get that knowledge whether we do it or not, you know, according to the materialist point of view. It's, it's almost a, you know, a pointless paradigm. But they pretend it's not true. When, when it comes to the intellectual stuff, they pretend, you know, or, or it's like they don't think about it, right? So, so, yeah. so then you've got this really interesting case where you've got people who are hardcore materialists, and the hardcore materialists have really surfaced in recent years. When Stephen and I did our show about the Mandela effect, we talked about this a little bit, um, I guess it was middle part of last year, and I observed that there's no Wikipedia article on the Mandela effect. If you look up the Mandela effect in Wikipedia, you get sent to an article on, I think it's called false memory. And I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. well, I understand that, you know, that that's one school of thought as to what the Mandela effect is. And in part three, we'll, we'll get into what's going on with the Mandela effect. But it's been widely noted that Wikipedia has been taken over by a group of kind of James Randi devotees, right? People who are uh, uh, kind of on the hard line side of skepticism and come from a, a, a kind of an almost radical materialist view of the world. And I loved what you wrote in the book about the, and I've got the acronym wrong here. I know I do, but it's the church of logical objectivism and something orthodox skepticism, right? To, and the, and, and it spells out clowns. Tell, tell us about these people. Yeah, it's uh I, 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 obviously I came up with the acronym just to be snarky, but um, <laughs> it, it really does kind of drive me nuts because the, these are, are these people, and it feels like it's a church. You know, it feels yeah. like it's a, a, a dogmatic religion that, you know, dare anybody challenge anything of their dogma, you know, you're going to get the wrath of the, you know, the head of the church, who's James Randi or uh, Richard Dawkins or whoever. And, um, you know, so, so then they, they start insulting people like any scientist that goes out there and pushes the boundaries uh, of some of these ideas. They are called a pseudoscientist, even if they've got, you know, impeccable credentials and they've used the scientific method, uh, double-blind studies in their experiments, all of that, they still get hammered by, by these people. And it, and it resembles a cult more than anything else. So... Um, yeah, it's an ugly aspect of things, and you're right. For some reason, uh, Wikipedia has gotten an awful lot of these contributors to it. Um, they're not very open-minded. Uh, they're not really looking at all the data uh, very well, and somehow they've you know, kind of latched onto this materialist idea. Well, they're, they're, they're real quick, it seems to me, or at least there's a group within them, very quick to slap a label like pseudoscience on things, very quick to, to tell you that, what you're reading isn't something you should take seriously. You know, it's, it's become, it's become a very kind of slanted editorial thing they do over in Wikipedia. But, but I think you're right when you say, say it's a religion, it's at least a very powerful uh, ideology, right? That it, that, yeah, it is. That it's, that it's, it's turned into. And, and I wonder, 
have you thought about this? What do you think is the appeal? What is so appealing to people about that kind of, you know, almost rigid materialism? What what makes that such a such a popular way of looking at things? Um, I think it feels uh, safe and logical to them. And you know, this is where my my uh, universe solved and digital consciousness world kind of spills over into my uh, my day job world. Um, I'm a uh, you know, kind of a, a leadership coach, um, and uh, you know, I've spent you know, quite a few years like helping companies transform. And in today's world, I think the Army calls it um, VUCA: volatility, uncertainty, change, and ambiguity. You know, we 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 deal with a whole different world than we dealt with a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago, you know, there, there wasn't so much complexity. There weren't so many interfaces. There weren't so many people talking about different things. There weren't so many challenges. There, weren't, there wasn't so much ambiguity. Then we just networked everybody together. And, you know, the, again, Moore's law has caused, you know, the speed of communication and, and, and knowledge gaining to be just tremendous now. And so now we're, we're, we're filled with ambiguity. And so in the face of that, there are certain kinds of, um, you know, if you look at sort of like the evolution of uh, a human mind, you know, as a, as a child we focus on thir- certain things and we learn different things. Um, and, and cognitive science and, and learning, learning scientists have uh, kind of modeled the different stages that people go through. And as adults, we go through quite a few different stages um, that are characterized by how we treat people, how we consider our opinions, how open-minded we are, and things like that. The very early stages, uh, you know, one of them is called an expert stage, and it, and it tends to be like I remember I was in that stage when I was in college. You know, you couldn't tell me anything uh, without an argument, and right, uh, right. So, so it's it's very common in an early adult stage, but then people move beyond that to an achiever stage, and a catalytic stage, and these other things. But the point is that um, most people kind of get stuck in the expert, maybe the expert or achiever stage, and I think these um, materialists have been stuck in the expert stage. So their worldview is one of there's only one right answer, um, things can only be done one way, anybody who doesn't believe me is a fool, and that's a very primitive mind. And, and unfortunately, that's the kind of mind that there are, there are tend to be a lot of uh, in this world. And, and they, you know, I think if they stay open-minded, if they try to learn and they try to evolve their thinking, they're going to get to a different stage and they're going to start saying, okay, well, that has validity, but that doesn't. Um, or, or, you know, that has a little bit more. And they're going to think of things more in terms of gray, how much evidence supports this theory versus that theory, as opposed to thinking of things in a very black and white binary way. Uh, so, so that's my theory is that they're just, so the average person is, is more in that expert stage um, where they want to have one solid answer. It feels more comfortable to them um, than ambiguity or uncertainty. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. You know, I, I do some of that kind of stuff myself. I, I do uh, some some training and I, I give keynote talks sometimes. And one of my big topics is I talk about outrageous optimism. I, I talk about why, why we need to be a lot more optimistic about the future. And there's this problem that it's, it's not cool to be optimistic. It's cool, actually, to be pretty cynical. That cynical mm-hmm. has always been, Matt Ridley had a good thing in the Wall Street Journal last week about that, actually. You know, why, why is it cool to, to be a pessimist? But it is. It's always been, it's always been kind of the, the socially accepted and socially smiled upon thing is to, is to, is to be the person who, who sees the downside of things. And I think there's something very similar here with materialism. I think it's, it, it, it's, it's just a diff, slightly different flavor of the same kind of risk aversion that if you're a, if you're a pessimist, you can cut out all the, all the possibilities of life. You cut so much out that could be achieved in favor of, well, I won't be wrong, right? I won't miss out. Right. On it. I'm not going to say something good's going to happen and then have it not happen. Same kind of idea here. I'm not going to let myself believe in something and then have it turn out not to be true. Better to just cut everything off, right? Kind of, uh, yep. kind, of kind of approach to the world. Well, I, I think that's unfortunate, but I, I think that really does account for it. And as, it's interesting as the world gets more complex, that need for certainty just grows. And it seems that people are looking for for more and more outlets for certainty. That's a that's an interesting one, an unfortunate one. But hey, we're getting we're getting way off track here. We want to talk about <laughs> we want to talk about though. 
Yeah, yeah, it's fun stuff. The, the prime mover. Let's let's get into that a little bit. Jim, I got a question for you. How did everything start? Um, I don't I don't know, Phil. I, I, that, that's something that uh, you know we can really only speculate about. Um, I included a little section in the book that um, really re- reflects more uh, say Tom Campbell and Stephen Kaufman's theory about how things may have started. Um, and, and it could have started that way, and, and I like their uh, their view on it. But I feel like the the origin is really pretty speculative, so I don't have a, a strong opinion about it. Okay, um, give their answer then. That's fine. That's fine. But, but yeah, th- th- their view is that you know things started as a great void, and then um, at some point there was uh, a disturbance that created. Uh, a polarity between part of the void and another part of the void. And now you have essentially um, two opposing, you know, elements. And that polarity creates space. Just the fact there's one thing in one place and something in some somewhere else. And now if those two flip in polarity, then that creates time because the, the frequency at which they flip is now a kind of a heartbeat in, in the system. Well, how did all of this happen? You know, this is where, like, any system of origin has to rely on some faith, you know, has to rely on some, you know, argument that you can't explain any further. Uh, so, you know, the idea here, and, and I, should, I should probably make this clear that what, what they're talking about is not the reality that we're in. They're talking right. about the more fundamental reality that begat the reality that we're the in. The reality that produces the simulation, right. So yeah, exactly. Ultimately, you got to get back to that. that's right. We're we're one step. We're the prime mover of the prime mover at this point. Right. And 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 I I can make a good argument for how the reality learning lab or the simulation that we're in got started, and and that feels pretty good to me. But how the the deeper one got started, you know, I don't know. I'm just saying saying what the, what this idea is, and uh, you know, so so then as it gets more and more complex. Um, it's driven by this rule of fundamental uh, uh, improvement. So it's always trying to improve itself and to uh, evolve it, itself, it, its consciousness. This is where consciousness comes in. You know, this is pure consciousness. This is the definition of consciousness is this system that is uh, based on reality cells. So at some point, it, it gets sufficiently complex where it can start to uh, do some more interesting things, like it can subdivide. It can, you know, say, okay, here's a piece of consciousness over here. Um, that's going to be Phil's. Here's a piece of consciousness over here. This is, this is going to be Jim's. Phil and Jim, why don't you guys talk to each other, you know, and see how, how far you can evolve your consciousness just by talking to each other. And then maybe, mm-hmm. well, that didn't work out all that well. It doesn't seem like we're evolving that fast. What if we had a, um, a system that we – that Jim and Phil and others could interact with where they could really learn. And what differs in that system is, um, a, 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 you know, a suspension of the true reality. So they think that that system is, is following a set of rules. They all have a consensus. Everybody who's playing in that system is having a consensus about what the experience is like in that system. And that makes it feel really hard and really physical. And they're going to take their lessons a lot more seriously that way. And then that, you know, that's how our reality came about. Um, I'm paraphrasing, you know, you know, eons of evolution into 120 seconds here. <laughs> that's but, fine. Uh, you know, that's, it, because that, the show can only take up so much time. That's yeah, fair. But, but that's one way, Phil, that it, that it could have happened. Um, and I like it. I, I think it's a, it's a neat model. That's why... I included it in the book, but uh, it's certainly nothing I came up with. But I, I thought it was an interesting model for for an origin model. Well, I like I like what you say in the book. You said, it, it, according to this idea, according to this model, in the beginning there was nothing, a great void, and a simple rule, right? So you get everything down to just that little bit, and it really reminded me a lot of. Have you read A Universe from Nothing by Lawrence Krauss? No, I haven't. Okay, so physicist, you know, he's a materialist, obviously, but he does his level best using our current understanding. There's a good book about, about physics, but uh, does his level best to get it down to how nothing could lead to the universe. And mm-hmm. you know what? He gets, he almost gets there, right? It's like, <laughs> it's, 
it's almost nothing. But uh, do you remember Roseanne, Rosanna Dana on Saturday Night Live? You might be too young. Uh, Mr. Richard Fader from Fort Lee, New Jersey, right? Dear Roseanne, Rosanna Dana. Yes, I do. <laughs> well, you remember how it always ended, right? It's always something, right? It's always something. <laughs> There's there's something, uh, and no one can no one can apparently get it all the way back to nothing. You got to start with something, and I'll tell you if you're going to start with something, a void and a rule is about as close to nothing as you're going to get. I think I think you may these guys right. may have topped Lawrence Krauss there. Although I recommend that book, you you might want to I think you'll you'll find some interesting um, some interesting ideas in there. So so pushing on just a little bit to to that evolution that you described, you end up with um, the setup. That, that we currently have, which is that fundamental reality and the reality we're in. And we've got this quote from Thomas Campbell. I'll just share this. He says, the digital world consists only of organization, nothing else. Reality is organized bits. That's kind of what we were talking about in the first show. Now, those bits obviously have to be resident in some kind of substrate if we're talking about mm-hmm. information technology. So that's where we get the whole notion of uh, universal consciousness, ATTI, all that there is, and the Reality Learning Lab. So that's the cosmos. Could you draw a quick picture of everything for us there, Jim? Sure. Yeah, so imagine this, uh, what we think of as our reality, our apparent physical reality. Think of that as a cloud. Um, I call it the Reality Learning Lab. That cloud exists within a much larger cloud, which is all that there is, and that Uh, outside of our reality learning lab is a truer reality. So it's kind of like the analogy would be, you know, I go into a computer lab, I pop on my my virtual reality goggles, and now I've I've jumped up a level into a simulated world. That's kind of what we're talking about here, differences in levels of reality. The deeper reality is all that there is. Uh, Some people could use the word God instead of all that there is. By some definition, that is what God is. Um, you know, we tend to think of God as a as an entity, but you know, we can think of it a little bit differently. So I, I like to use the word "all that there is." So that's the bigger cloud. That bigger cloud consists of uh, the Reality Learning Lab, but it also that's where our consciousness is. Our consciousness is out there in the bigger cloud. It's not coming out of our brain. Um, it's not in the reality learning lab. The reality learning lab is just that. It's just something that we interact with other uh, individuals with. Our consciousness is out there, which means that we're ultimately immortal because I, somebody could theoretically go in and scramble up the data that makes our consciousness, I suppose. Um, that would make a good movie. But, you know, the, 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 the mystics and, and all the other uh, you know, evidence that kind of supports this or the confluence of ideas that support this idea, they all say the same thing. We're all connected. Well, this is how we're all connected. We're all part of that, um, of, of all that there is. That's how we're connected. But at the same time, we're also individuated because we are a subset of that. And that subset is our, you know, unique consciousness. I mean, this explains reincarnation. It explains past life recollections. It explains a lot of the more metaphysical anomalies, but it also explains the observer effect and, and some quantum mechanics anomalies, and I'm sure we're, we're going to get into some of that stuff too. Well, absolutely, absolutely. I want to I talk about this a little bit. Um, I, I've got a lot of questions about individuated versus universal consciousness because it's a, it's a really fascinating idea, and as you said, it does resonate with a lot of kind of pre-existing ideas from the realm of religion and spirituality. When you talk about God versus immortal souls, or you know, when you talk about a kind of a uh, what's it called, a pantheistic view of, of the universe, or there's the, mm-hmm. this this idea of um, oh, I can't think of the term now. Um, it's this consciousness that permeates uh, the whole universe. Pan, uh, panpsychism. Panpsychism. Yeah, all, all these ideas. That come up either in science or um, on the on the metaphysical side. This this really resonates with a lot of, a lot of those ideas. But b- b- before we before we get into that, I I got a couple of questions now, just on kind of the setup. Okay, just on the architecture mm-hmm. here of our of, of of everything of ATTI, all that there is. So we got the universal consciousness, and then we got the reality learning lab. We are in the reality learning lab. We are uh, individuated consciousnesses that exist in the greater substrate uh but we're here now right we're, mm-hmm. we're 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 
in this one and we're experiencing we're basically we're one analogy would be we're playing a computer game for example right living living in this uh, reality now when you say that elsewhere in the book when you say that reality is digital you're saying that the reality learning lab is digital right i mean is it possible that ATTI uh, and consciousness itself that those are continuous uh, I, I yeah i suppose that you could say that there is a uh, you know something a, a continuous substrate that creates uh, digital pieces and i talked before about the layers of the the rock and the pond um, as an example where digital or discrete can create continuous and, and create continuous can create discrete that, that's possible however it doesn't make sense to me you know why why search for a continuous model when con continuous means infinite resolution it means those infinities again um, if there was a system that was driven by a fundamental rule of continuous improvement and it you know it, it needs to modify itself in some way it's a lot simpler to modify itself um, if it's composed of reality cells or bits as opposed to composed of infinities so just from the again Occam's razor standpoint it it, 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 it it seems odd to me that the construct that we're in is digital but the deeper level construct would be continuous um, so it's, it's part of the reason why I like Tom Campbell's model it implies uh, also digital all the way down in in that level and you know one of the other Yep, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say the reason the reason I ask is because when you say that consciousness is immortal, it feels like we have a continuous thing there. It feels like we have an infinity there, um, mm -hmm. in in terms of consciousness itself. It seems like so, but but we come from that deeper reality. So that's that's one reason I wondered if maybe that um, that wasn't the case. Also, I, I would just ask: Is it appropriate? for us to take what we see as limitations within the reality learning lab and apply those back to the greater reality that we really can't experience and don't know too much about. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I do try to avoid things that seem purely speculative to me. I mean, it is fun to talk about them. And I think there's, you know, I've gone deeper in this book than I did in the first book because I think the evidence supports those deeper things. But when you get really, you know, way down into how did this actually start, that's that's pretty speculative. And, and I just I, I present, you know, one possibility there. Um, w one thing I did want to mention is uh, I've, I've used this analogy before. If, if you have an objective to achieve something, like let's say you um, you want to run for president. You wouldn't go knocking on doors and, and trying to convince people to vote for you. Um, why? Because it would take forever to do that. You know, let's say it takes four hours to convince somebody of your point of view and that you'd make a great president. Okay, great. Multiply four hours times, you know, 250 million people, and you'll find that you'll be knocking on doors, uh, you know, for millennia. But um, so, so what do you do? You you build a coalition you you get um, you know a number of people who believe in your idea and you get them to knock on doors and the math works out in such a way that it, a hierarchical structure kind of makes sense in the same way if the bigger system if God all that there is wants to um, evolve itself in some way by subdividing into individuated consciousnesses what's the best way for it to do it it's you know as I mentioned before you know, breaking them up into little pieces and telling each one of them to evolve is a lot better than trying to evolve the entire thing all at once. So the, the whole structure of what we apparently have, individuated consciousnesses and the reality learning lab to help learn our lessons to evolve, makes total sense from the standpoint of a evolutionary system that wants to evolve. That makes sense. Okay, uh, I, I I can I can see that. I'm st I'm still holding out though that if I'm immortal, I feel like I've got an infinity going on there. To, to me, that that seems like uh, yeah. Or, and and let me let me correct that statement. When I say immortal, I, I I say it the way we think of it. I have no idea. Again, this is this is a uh, you know one of those speculative things. I have no idea when it goes very very far out um, how long the consciousness might exist. You know, the mm -hmm. system may say. Hey, this this method is you know not as effective as a fractal method you know and a fractal method now is going to have you know 
these individuated consciousnesses that break down in, in fractals into even smaller pieces. And so, you know, the idea of a, a humanity may, may go away. Um, right now, for what it's worth, there does seem to be evidence that our uh, consciousness lives on past death, um, near-death experiences and past life recollections. I mentioned those before and, and, and some other things, uh, out-of-body experiences and so forth. So there, there does seem to be some evidence, and there's also this, you know, confluence of Eastern thinking and, uh, you know, thinking in, in, in different cultures throughout the world and throughout time that all line up in exactly the same way to support the same idea. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think you can discount that. I, and I, there's, a, there's a real reason why you can't, which, which we'll probably get into. Um, if there, it, it's because of subjective experiences that, that people are having. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, may, maybe immortal – in the, in the sense of infinite immortality isn't accurate, um, but it's immortal as long as this structure, this virtual reality uh, learning lab exists and the, all that there is is structured the way it, it is, broken up into these individuated consciousnesses. So what do you think's in the, uh, or, or is, is this getting too speculative if we ask this, what all is in the reality learning lab? This universe is in it. Is there anything else in there? Are there other universes? Are there other um, versions of this universe or completely different universes? What's, what all is going on in there? Well, um, a good question. We, we could, let, let's take an analogy of uh, a computer game. I, mean, I hate to do this, but it, it kind of makes it a little bit concrete. And, and it's a, a good analogy that's easy to, to visualize. So you have a computer game that gives you the ability to interact with other people and, you know, form coalitions and, uh, you know, hunt or wh whatever it is that you want to do in that fantasy world. That everything, you know, you ask the question, what's in there? Well, what's in there is everything that exists in that system that was designed by its designer um, at that point in time. Now, maybe in version 2.0, or maybe when people, when the, when the system realizes or the designer realizes that it has uh, kind of outserved its function, you know, it's losing, losing traction, people are going to a, a more competitive game, or there, uh, you know, there are too many people that want to be in it, they have to make a modification to it, or they want something more exciting. Um, they want to discover new continents, for example. Um, now you can go in and put a patch into the system and create new continents. So getting back to your question of what's in the reality learning lab, as far as we know, everything that we know um, is in it. So all the things that we're discovering in outer space, um, all the things that we're discovering as we peer deeper into a microscope, um, those things are all there. Now, were they all there before we peered into outer space that deep or into the microscope? I don't think so. This is where um, I believe there's an efficient process of, say, dynamic reality creation that is going on, which explains a lot of the quantum mechanics things. So as, as, a, as a quick example, some experiments show that things are in a suspended state until somebody actually measures that thing, and they've done experiments to rule out all of the other loopholes and possibilities that could explain this. Um, and so it really resembles the, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody's there to hear it, does it, does it, did it really fall? Does it make a sound? It really, really resembles that, that idea at the quantum level. And this can very easily be explained by an efficient system that it doesn't call the stuff into reality until it's actually needed. We don't right. need to establish the position of the photon, or we don't need to determine which slot it went through in the double slit experiment until we have the requirement to make a measurement. Now we do need to, to create that. So saying what slot did it really go through is the wrong thing to say. It's what slot have we, you know, are, are we now saying that it went through? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so we're, we're, we're creating that as we go. So to say what's in reality now, it's everything we know, but it's all unfolding all the time. I think it's very possible that something like dark matter could lead to, uh, you know, the, the evidence that, that there's a parallel reality there. That's, that's very possible. Um, we'll have to see how it goes. Maybe the system responds to 
the experiments that we make and the conclusions that we make and generate some things to keep us, uh, you know, evolved and interested. So we get a bunch of kind of sweeping statements in the book um, around kind of the nature of everything, the nature of reality. You, you, you say consciousness is immortal. We have free will. We are connected. Our lives have purpose. We're here to learn. We can shape our reality. Material things have no lasting value. I would point out that those sound an awful lot like religious beliefs. So mm -hmm. when, when we get to that level of discussion, how are these ideas different from religious dogma? Um, they're not that different. And uh, I would say that that's a good thing because what happens, what's happened in history is, is people have had uh, mystical experiences. And, and there's been research, you know, modern research, cognitive scientists have, have done research on what that is. What does that mean? I think there were some astronauts that had some mystical experiences. There, there have been doctors and other people who have them. They sit down and all of a sudden, like, you know, things disappear in their, in their consciousness and they have some greater connectedness and they learn things that they couldn't have learned just from the normal day-to-day -day interaction of stuff. Um, so, so these mystical experiences that have happened to people over the years have resulted a lot of times in religions. You know, think of uh, the Buddha, think of, um, you know, the founder of the Sikh faith, think of uh, Muhammad, think of Jesus. Um, and the, when somebody has that mystical experience, what they're, what they're really doing is they're getting out of the reality and learning lab, and their awareness is now in the more real state. So if, it, if that's what happens and they're able to um, learn something more fundamental and, and then come back and retain that memory, there's no reason why that can't happen. They show a model of, of how that ap appears to happen in the book. When they come back, they have this realization that, ah, there is something bigger. Well, they, they all say the same thing. They all say those things that I mentioned. It's not just a... Um, you know, somebody writing down a bunch of stuff to explain where the tree came from or why we have seasons. It's things, you know, it's the, the consistency of different cultures' experiences when they've had mystical experiences. Um, you know, Aboriginal cultures, uh, Indian, uh, uh, you know, Native American, African, all of these. It's so similar, it's striking. And, and right. it, what, could, what could explain that? Well, it could explain it if you say, well, the reason I'm having experience is because I heard about this other one. But, no, they've even determined that there have been, you know, independent um, cultures that have had no contact, uh, you know, with, with uh, you know, some, some other culture who had already come up with some of these, these ideas, and they had the same idea. So independent, um, you know, independent thinking about about uh, some of these things. So it does sound very spiritual, but at the same time, it also matches what psychologists are learning from some of their patients. It matches uh, what Edgar Cayce said, um, you know, who was known to have had a efficacy rate of something like 85 or 90 percent in his, in his medical diagnoses, and he doesn't even know why. Um, you know, all these instances of independent people tapping into the greater thing come up, come to the same conclusions. And that's, that's real evidence. You know, you, you could say, well, we throw it out because it's not reproducible. I can't automatically go into the same mystical experience or mystical state that I went into yesterday. That's true. But reproducibility isn't all there is in science. You know, sometimes it's, um, you know, statistical, like how many people have experienced this kind of thing, and statistically is that significant compared to random chance? Um, so, you know, I'd be, be careful of thinking that it's not pure science to just, you know, look at a confluence of ideas and, and think that that is something that's, um, you know, it's a significant piece of evidence that tells us something about our reality. Yeah, I, I one could make the argument that, this comes from a collective unconscious, right? That this is somehow mm -hmm. programmed and, you know, it's kind of evolutionarily built into us. But then you still have the question, why? Why would we have that in our collective unconscious? Where would that, where would that have come from? And why would it be there in the first place? But, 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 but my actual question would be, would you agree that there is a qualitative difference between what we're talking about 
in this discussion than what we talked about in part one. I feel like that's a little more cut and dried. When we make the case that it's simulation, it seems like we've got to, you know, we talk physics and we, and, 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 we, and we make an empirical case. Here, we're doing something a little bit different. And I wonder, can we be as certain, I guess, about this one as we are about the other one? Or is this one a little bit more uh, up for grabs? Uh, I know exactly what you're saying. Uh, some of these things seem to fall more into the the woo woo realm or the you know the um, metaphysical realm or whatever, and that's certainly true. Um, however, you know there have been 13 million people who, uh, according to a Gallup poll, who experienced a, an NDE. Um, you know, and th they've had very similar experiences, and that that is real science when you do that research, but. If you, if you want something harder, um, I'd again go to uh, the world of quantum mechanics. So in this world, the people who have done the most advanced experiments in quantum mechanics have come to the conclusion that there is no objective reality, right. which means by definition it's a virtual reality, which is exactly what we're talking about. Um, it, you know, in, in Anton Zeilinger's experiment in 2007, uh, they proved to a certainty of one in 80 orders of magnitude that objective reality doesn't exist. And since then, all around the world, um, additional experiments have done the same thing. They've closed all the loopholes of um, allowing for objective reality, and there's nothing left. So it's basically proven to a higher degree of certainty than almost anything else has proven that objective reality doesn't exist. And still you have the materials that are just not letting go of their their, their religion. Right. Well, I guess then my, my, my other way of phrasing the question would be maybe not that, um, uh, not that it's proven as well, but, but maybe just that, that we don't know as much yet, that, that our knowledge of the spirit realm, yeah, there's a lot of evidence for it, okay, and, and you can take that as scientific, but what we take away from that still exists kind of at a, at a fairly high level, and that uh, maybe the analogy would be that what we currently have is kind of a heliocentric model, right, of the spiritual realm, mm -hmm. that, we, that we, don't, we don't know everything about it yet that we're going to know about it at some point, and uh, we're off to a good start. We've got a working model, but, um, but there's a lot more yet to be learned. Sure, and you know the the other than the science, uh, the quantum physics that we just talked about, I the the other area where this is mathematically, logically, and scientifically sound is when you use abductive logic. Um, so this is a logic that says we've got a bunch of theories. Which theory is the best fit to what's out there? And we use this kind of logic in real science all the time. In medicine, that's, you know, that's how, how it's done. You know, we, you've got a bunch of symptoms. Um, what do those symptoms match in terms of a disease or an ailment or, you know, what's the source of this? Um, best fit to those, that set of symptoms. So medicine uses abductive logic all the time. Anthropology uses abduct, abductive logic. We can't go back and look and see, you know, how did things evolve or, or so forth. We have to come to those conclusions based on the best fit theory to the evidence that we have. And so that's what, you know, the, the ultimate message of the book is that I've used abductive logic to identify, oh, I think, 14 different anomalies from the scientific world, from the metaphysical world, from all over the place. And I've looked at all of the theories or, you know, uh, you know, religions or uh, scientific methods, protocols that could explain some of them and how many of them they actually explain. String theory explains two of them. Deterministic materialism explains one. Abrahamic religion explains four of them. You know, and, and I go through this uh, event diagram approach that basically shows that the simulation theory, you know, a la Nick Bostrom, that one explains a lot. But the digital consciousness theory, uh, very similar to uh, uh, Tom Campbell's uh, My Big Toe and Stephen Kaufman's theory, um, it explains all of them. It explains the delayed choice quantum eraser experiment. It, it explains precognition. It explains near-death experiences. And so that, that's, real, uh, that's a real scientific protocol that, uh, that we can fall back on that makes this feel a lot less woo-woo, if you will. 
Absolutely, absolutely. By the way, I love your Venn diagrams in the book. Speaking as a as a product marketing guy, right? Where I don't. <laughs> done a lot of that kind of stuff and it's like here we got to set this out from the competition right and you really do you really make your case i think quite convincingly all right well listen jim we have done the hard work now we, we have established that we live in a simulation and we've and we've set the groundwork for basically how it works now we're going to come back in part three and we're going to have some fun we're going to talk about the mandela effect we're going to talk about ufos we're gonna, all, all that stuff that uh that, that we love to get into. Well, uh, get your thoughts on, have you seen uh, Project Blue Book yet? Uh, no, I haven't seen that. I, oh, okay. I heard, it, heard it was good, though. Yeah, I am a, a Black Mirror fan and uh, Bandersnatch and some of those things that are, you know, really exploring some of these ideas, too. Yeah, lots of, lots of, great, lots of great stuff to talk about. I'm looking forward to it. It should be a really fun discussion. Awesome. Looking forward to it, Phil. All right. Thanks so much for being with us, Jim. Thank you all for listening. We will be back with part three of our discussion with Jim Elvidge. And until next time, live to see it.